wiped as rare. You sure the third one's contained? Yes. Unless they figured out how to open doors. I am Ryan McKnight. I'm Kara Santa Maria. I am Christopher Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. This, this is Naked Mormonism. Mormonism. The Serial Mormon History Podcast. sound were you followed did she see you we must be careful they're everywhere all right let's do this when we last checked in with joseph smith he was sharing letter correspondence with his new acting major general wilson law and wife emma Nauvoo was Joe's kingdom, but he couldn't be seen in town lest he risk arrest and extradition. However, Joe didn't just stay in one place. When he first went into hiding, his uncle John Smith on the Iowa side of the river offered a brief place of refuge. But then it was off to his friend Sayer's home, where Joe hunkered down for a few days. He spent these days writing as much as conversing with Mormon elites that were showing up from time to time. The heartfelt letter exchange between Emma and Joe was notable. We spent a bit of time on it last week. When Emma had gone to see Joe at Sayers Farm, she asked him if she could go meet with Governor Carlin and Quincy. Joe took a few days to think about it and sent the letter telling her that she could send Carlin a letter, but that a meeting with him wasn't a good idea. The letter that Emma sent to Governor Carlin is extremely interesting. Why I find it so fascinating is because it doesn't paint Emma as a concerned wife simply pleading to the governor to forgive her husband's sins and then exonerate him. It reads as if she's reasoning with him. She's wielding power in Nauvoo, and she's willing to actually work with the governor almost as an equal, even if Carlin would never see her as an equal. Here's the letter to which I'm referring, dictated by Emma, written by her secretary, Eliza R. Snow. To His Excellency... Governor Thomas Carlin. Sir, it is with feelings of no ordinary cast that I have retired, after the business of the day and evening too, to address your honor. I am at a loss how to commence. My mind is crowded with subjects too numerous to be contained in one letter. I find myself almost destitute of that confidence necessary to address a person holding the authority of your dignified and responsible office. Flattery. It'll get you everywhere. I would now offer as an excuse for intruding upon your time and attention the justice of my cause. Was my cause the interest of an individual or of a number of individuals? Then perhaps I might be justified in remaining silent. But it is not, nor is it the pecuniary interest of a whole community alone that prompts me again to appeal to your excellency. But dear sir... It is for the peace and safety of hundreds, I may safely say, of this community, who are not guilty of any offense against the laws of the country, and also the life of my husband, who has not committed any crime whatever. Neither has he transgressed any of the laws or any part of the Constitution of the United States. Neither has he at any time infringed upon the rights of any man or of any class of men or community of any description. Need I say he is not guilty of the crime alleged against him by Governor Boggs? Indeed, it does seem entirely superfluous for me or any one of his friends in this place to testify his innocence of that crime, when so many of the citizens of your place and of many other cities in the state as well as in the territory do know positively that the statement of Governor Boggs is without the least shadow of truth— we do know, and so do many others, that the prosecution against him has been conducted in an illegal manner, and every act demonstrates the fact that all the design of the prosecution is to throw him into the power of his enemies without the least ray of hope that he would ever be allowed to obtain a fair trial, and that he would be inhumanely and ferociously murdered. No person having a knowledge of the existing circumstances has one remaining doubt— and your honor will recollect you said to me that you would not advise Mr. Smith ever to trust himself in Missouri. And dear sir, you cannot for one moment indulge one unfriendly feeling towards him if he abides by your counsel. Then, sir, why is it that he should be thus cruelly pursued? Why not give him the privilege of the laws of this state? 
When I reflect upon the many cruel and illegal operations of Lilburn W. Boggs and the consequent suffering of myself and family, and the incalculable losses and suffering of many hundreds who survived, and the many precious lives that were lost, all the effect of unjust prejudice and misguided ambition produced by misrepresentation and calumny, my bosom heaves with unutterable anguish. You know, Joe didn't do it, but Boggs totally deserved it. That's how I read that. And who that is as well acquainted with the facts as the people of the city of Quincy would censure me if I should say that my heart burned with just indignation towards our columnators, as well as the perpetrators of those horrid crimes. But how happy would I now be to pour out my full heart in gratitude to Governor Boggs if he had rose up with dignity and authority of the chief executive of the state— and put down every illegal transaction and protected the peaceable citizens and enterprising immigrants from the violence of plundering outlaws who have ever been a disgrace to the state and always will so long as they go unpunished. Yes, I say, how happy would I be to render him not only the gratitude of my own heart, but the cheering effusions of the joyous souls of fathers and mothers, of brothers and sisters, widows and orphans, who he might have saved by such a course. From now drooping under the withering hand of adversity brought upon them by the persecutions of wicked and corrupt men. That seems like a fair argument. If Lilburn Boggs would have done his job, and that was the chief criticism. I even voiced it. The historical record shows it. Lilburn Boggs didn't do his job very well. If he would have just done his job, then Emma would be pouring out the effusions of her heart to him. She would be cheering him on, and the joyous souls of everybody in the Mormon community would love Lillenburn Boggs, but no. Now, Emma goes on to appeal to Carlin's logic. Joe was the head of the people, and without him they are lost. And now may I entreat your excellency to lighten the hand of oppression and persecution which is laid upon me and my family, which materially affect the peace and welfare of this whole community. For let me assure you that there are many whole families that are entirely dependent upon the prosecution and success of Mr. Smith's temporal business for their support. And if he is prevented from attending to the common avocations of life, who will employ those innocent, industrious, poor people and provide for their wants? Now Emma appeals to his kindness that he had expressed at various times to her and to Joseph you know, on a personal one-to-one -one basis. But, my dear sir, when I recollect the interesting interview and I and my friends had with you at your place, and the warm assurances you gave us of your friendship and legal protection, I cannot doubt for a moment your honorable sincerity, but do still expect you to consider our claims upon your protection from every encroachment upon our legal rights as loyal citizens, as we have always been, still are, and are determined always to be law-abiding people. Now Emma goes on to make an appeal to Carlin's sense of justice. Joe wasn't anywhere near Boggs when he was shot. How could he possibly be guilty of attempted murder? And I still assure myself that when you are fully acquainted with illegal proceedings practiced against us in the suit of Governor Boggs, you will recall those writs which have been issued against Mr. Smith in Rockwell, as you must be aware that Mr. Smith was not in Missouri, and of course he could not have left there with many other considerations which, if duly considered, will justify Mr. Smith in the course he has taken. And then it turns to the final heart cell. This is a great way to cap off the letter. And now I appeal to your excellency as I would unto a father who is not only able but willing to shield me and mine from every unjust prosecution. I appeal to your sympathies and beg you to spare me and my helpless children. I beg you to spare my innocent children the heart-rending sorrow of again seeing their father unjustly dragged to prison or to death. I appeal to your affections as a son and beg you to spare our aged mother, the only surviving parent we have left. The insupportable affliction of seeing her son, who she knows to be innocent of the crimes laid to his charge, thrown again into the hands of his enemies, who have so long sought for his life, in whose life and prosperity she only looks for the few remaining comforts she can enjoy. I entreat of your excellency to spare us these afflictions and many sufferings which cannot be uttered, 
and secure to yourself the pleasure of doing good and vastly increasing human happiness. Secure to yourself the benediction of the aged and the gratitude of the young and the blessing and veneration of the rising generation. Respectfully, your most obedient servant, Emma Smith. Postscript. Sir, I hope you'll favor me with an answer. It is quite the letter. Emma was no silent partner, mafia wife of the prophet. She was a contributing piece to the Mormon history puzzle. Even though her husband had told her not to meet with Carlin, she penned this powerful letter and sent it to Carlin by way of William Clayton as messenger. Clayton presented the letter to Governor Carlin and Judge Ralston on the 19th of August, 1842. According to Joe's journal, Carlin was impressed by the contents of the letter. He'd never received a letter like this before from a prominent woman of a society pleading to exonerate her husband. Apparently, though, he was quite amazed. What Carlin told William Clayton in this meeting is important, and we'll talk about why after reading the passage from Joseph's journal. The governor read the letter with much attention, apparently, and when he got through, he passed high encomiums on Sister Emma and expressed astonishment at the judgment and talent manifest in the manner of her address. He presented the letter to Judge Ralston, requesting him to read it. Governor Carlin then proceeded to reiterate the same language as on former occasion, viz. that he was satisfied there was no excitement anywhere but in Nauvoo, amongst the Mormons themselves. All was quiet and no apprehension of trouble in other places so far as he was able to ascertain. Now that is interesting, isn't it? So Carlin told William Clayton, reiterating what he had already told Emma, that the excitement in the country and Joe's fears of arrest and extradition were only in the minds of the Mormons in Nauvoo, which essentially is just telling them that nobody else cares about what's going on with the drama inside Nauvoo. Now, whether or not he said that is very important. You see, Governor Carlin was in a tight spot here. He had Governor Reynolds from Missouri on his back to extradite Joe and the rising of anti-Mormon rhetoric all putting pressure on him to arrest Joe and turn him over. However, this was right before midterm elections. Carlin's seat was up. He had to treat the Mormons favorably or he'd never be reelected. But if he sided with the Mormons, he'd make enemies within the Senate chambers. He would make the same mistake that Boggs did, trying to dance this fine line. Beyond that, there were so-called anti-Mormons, as the anti-Mormon party, who were sending Carlin letters every day and knocking on his door and asking him to march the state militia to Nauvoo and put the prophet into chains. The outrage felt against the prophet of the church was a Nauvoo phenomenon, based on the allegations made by Bennett's exposés that Joe was committing adultery and you know, other malicious acts. The outrage against Joseph Smith, however, was felt by thousands of people outside Nauvoo because a despot was growing ever stronger, assassinating public officials and attempting a complete overthrow of the government, all under the garb of religious fanaticism. So depending on who you were, what your religion is, or where you lived, you may be mad at Joe for different reasons. So the next passage in Joe's journal documenting what Carlin told William Clayton reveals that the outrage that he said earlier that was only in Nauvoo wasn't only in Nauvoo. The next passage in Joe's journal documents what Carlin told William Clayton, and it reveals that the outrage wasn't only in Nauvoo as the previous passage had indicated. He afterwards stated when conversing on another subject that persons were offering their services every day, either in person or by letter, and held themselves in readiness to come against us whenever he should call upon them. But he never had the least idea of calling out the militia, neither had he thought it was necessary. There was evidently a contradiction in his assertions in the above instance, and although he said there was no excitement but amongst the Mormons, it is evident he knew better. He also said that it was his opinion that if President Joseph would give himself up to the sheriff, he would be honorably acquitted and the matter would be ended. But on George Ralston asking how he thought the president could go through the midst of his enemies without violence being used towards him, and if acquitted, how he would get back, the governor was evidently at a loss to say, but made light of the matter, as though he thought it might be easily done. What Clayton reported to Joe about this interaction reveals that Governor Carlin was torn. Now, it, it would have been easiest for him if a vigilante mob found Joe and lynched him in the streets, thus trying to minimize the situation, telling William Clayton that if Joe just gives himself up, 
Don't worry about it. He's going to make it fine. He'll be honorably acquitted. He, they don't have any evidence to prove that he was the guy who shot Governor Boggs or that he orchestrated it, but trying to minimize it. But even Judge Ralston in that same interaction said, how is that going to happen, Governor Carlin? I don't know, but it, it'll it be done easily. No worries. So really, it was in Carlin's best interest to have Joe just the whole Joseph problem taken care of, whatever that looked like, right? Have him lynched in the streets, vigilante justice. However, Joe was in hiding at this time and safe within the confines of his kingdom and his closest elites wouldn't betray him. Not yet, anyway. Whatever happened to Joe, Carlin always had to be at an arm's length to plausibly deny any part in the arrest or the death of Joseph Smith. If at any point it could be assumed by any Mormons that Joe felt the wrath of law as a result of Carlin's actions, Carlin would never be elected again while he was representing the Mormon voting bloc. But what does it look like on a governor's reputation to have a sovereign uprising of religious fanatics in your constituency and then have to call out the state militia to put them down? Carlin was completely stuck. However, if Joe just happened to be in town and found by an enemy mob and, you know, lynched in the middle of the streets, which, you know, could never be tied back to Carlin, maybe the problem solves itself. So Carlin telling Clayton that Joe had nothing to fear, that he should just give himself up, may have had some ulterior motives. Joe had what information he needed concerning Carlin's true alignment. To conclude that entry in his journal, quote, He took great care to state that it was not his advice that Mr. Smith should give himself up, but thought it would be soonest decided. It appeared evident that we have no great things to expect from Carlin, as it is evidence he is no friend. He acknowledged his ignorance of the law, touching the case in plain terms. End quote. That's a statement. From the prophet, the president of the church, Carlin is no friend. I wonder how that'll impact the elections that year. After Emma wrote this letter, she went and told Joe, and she said that he would be safest in town. He was still on Sarah's farm at this time, but if he was in town, she could keep an eye on him. Accordingly, Joe was moved back to Nauvoo on either August 18th or 19th. As recounted by Newell and Avery in their amazing book on Emma Smith, Mormon Enigma, quote, This same day, Emma learned that Harmon T. Wilson, the sheriff from the county seat at Carthage, had come to Nauvoo in disguise and had taken lodging at the Davis Tavern. A rumor reached Emma that Carlin was ready to issue a new writ and that Joseph's hiding place was known. She slipped out of her home in the dark of night and made her way with the faithful Derby to the Sayers farm to warn Joseph. Emma and Joseph and Erastus Derby left the Sayers place immediately and traveled on notice to Carlos Granger's house in Nauvoo, where, in spite of the hour, they were kindly received and well treated. Emma returned home reassured that Joseph was safe. End quote. Joe remained here in the basement of the Granger home for a few days. It was safe there. His first day in Nauvoo, hiding there, Joe penned a curious letter. Now, to put this letter into context, We need to understand that Emma was at all times fighting to keep her husband safe. She couldn't be seen acting too out of the ordinary within Nauvoo by the sheriff who still had a close eye on her or she would lead the sheriff right to Joe. Emma couldn't spend any time with Joe with only a very few minor exceptions where she just pop in and pop out. Now, the other side of that coin meant that Joe couldn't spend any time with his usual echelon of sycophants, fawning over his every word. He was in hiding. He couldn't go to meetings. He couldn't hang out with friends. In his mind, through no fault of his own, he was the victim of persecution and forced out of his home and regular duties by mobocrats. Of course, we know that everything that happened to him was purely a result of his own actions, but Joe was a hero of his own narrative, right? And he said it best when he famously stated that no man knows my history. Needless to say... Joe eventually got lonely. And this is the letter to some of his earliest Mormon converts and friends from the OG days, the Kirtland years of Mormonism. You'll find a link to this letter in the show notes. It's one of the few letters that Joe actually wrote himself instead of dictating. And you'll see why. Dear and beloved, Brother Newell K. Whitney and Sister Elizabeth Smith Whitney, etc., 
I take this opportunity to communicate some of my feelings privately at this time, which I want you three eternally to keep in your own bosoms. For my feelings are so strong for you since what has passed lately between us that the time of my absence from you seems so long and dreary that it seems as if I could not live long in this way. And if you three would come and see me in this my lonely retreat, it would afford me great relief of mind if those with whom I am allied do love me. Now is the time to afford me succor in the days of exile, for you know I foretold you of these things. I am now at Carlos Granger's, just back of Brother Hiram's farm. It is only a mile from town. The nights are very pleasant indeed. All three of you can come and see me in the forepart of the night. Let Brother Whitney come a little ahead and knock on the southeast corner of the house at the window. It is next to the cornfield. I have a room entirely by myself. The whole matter can be attended to with most perfect safety. I know it is the will of God that you should comfort me now in this time of affliction, or not at all, as now is the time, or never. But I have no need of saying any such thing to you, for I know the goodness of your hearts, and that you will do the will of the Lord when it was made known unto you. The only thing to be careful of is to find out when Emma comes, then you cannot be safe. But when she is not here, there is the most perfect safety. Only be careful to escape observation as much as possible. I know it is a heroic undertaking, but so much the greater friendship and the more joy when I see you. I will tell you all my plans. I've got a plan. I cannot write them on paper, Burn this letter as soon as you read it. Keep all locked up in your breasts. My life depends upon it. One thing I want to see you for is to get the fullness of my blessings sealed upon our heads, etc. You will pardon me for my earnestness on this subject when you consider how lonesome I must be. Your good feelings know how to make every allowance for me. I close my letter. I think Emma won't come tonight. If she don't, you will pardon me for my earnestness on this subject, when you consider how lonesome I must be. Your good feelings know how to make every allowance for me. I close my letter. I think Emma won't come tonight, and if she don't, don't fail to come tonight. I subscribe myself your most obedient and affectionate companion and friend. Signed, Joseph Smith. There's a lot to tease out in that letter. Let's spend some time on it here. So... Emma had been working to keep the, the church running in Joe's absence. And she had written a letter to the governor of the state on his behalf. She was taking care of the kids. And she even helped sneak Joe back into town from his previous hiding place a few miles out of town. Yet, as soon as she turns her back, he sends a letter to the Whitneys asking them to come meet him in the middle of the night and make sure that they aren't seen by Emma when they get there. Put this into... Uh, Deeper context, I quote again from Mormon Enigma, quote, The following day, August 18th, 1842, Joseph wrote another letter. That's the letter we just read. Three weeks earlier, on July 27th, in the presence and with the consent of Elizabeth Ann, Newell K. Whitney had performed the marriage ceremony uniting their 17-year-old daughter, Sarah Ann, to Joseph. Now from the Granger home, Joseph addressed a letter to, and then it reprints a number of extracts from the letter that we just read the entirety of. And then the paragraph concludes with this. No entry was made in Joseph's history for this day. End quote. What does this letter mean? There's a lot to tease out of it, and historians are all over the place about what the true intent of this letter is. Unfortunately, the intent isn't readily apparent when the letter is just read in its entirety and taken at face value. Was this a love letter from Joe to one of his teenage wives? Well, it was addressed to the entire Whitney family, and booty calls are really awkward with Sarah's parents there, right? But they had both consented three weeks earlier to Joe taking their daughter as one of his wives, so maybe it's not completely crazy to infer that a booty call was the purpose of this letter. Maybe Joe was just really lonely and wanted some good, long-time friends as company while he was in hiding. Now, that seems to comport with him saying, The time of my absence from you seems so long and dreary that it seems as if I could not live long in this way. And if you three would come see me in this my lonely retreat, it would afford me great relief of mind. But if this is just a letter about Joe wanting the company of the three Whitneys... Why did he ask them to avoid Emma and burn the letter after reading it? 
Now, that can be explained by the fact that Emma was being tailed by the sheriff in hopes that, you know, she would lead him to Joe's hideout. So if she didn't see the Whitney's coming over, maybe she wouldn't go over. Maybe the sheriff wouldn't follow her. Right. And also the letter told Joseph's location. It was a paper trail. Of course, he wanted it burned after they read it. So if Joe was just seeking companionship with some of his closest friends, why was it only the Whitney's that he invited? Also, why was it necessary to tell them that he has a room entirely to himself and the whole matter can be attended to with the most perfect safety? What matter? Safety? What is he talking about? And if they were just coming to visit an old friend, why did he also have to tell them that he knows it's the will of God that they should comfort him in this time of affliction or not at all? Why all or nothing? Why now or never? What's with the sense of urgency and invoking the will of God to convince them to make a trip a mile away and come hang out with him for the night? Why would they need to be convinced to do this? Now, those questions may be answered by the fact that Joe was on the run from the law and the Whitney's would understandably fear for their lives in the presence of a fugitive of two different states, right? A little forceful coercion deemed the will of God may have been necessary to convince them. That added with the secret knock that Newell was was supposed to use in order to signal to Joe that it was a friend on the other side of the door. You know, that, that does kind of make sense. He's on the run from the law. He had to be careful around him. Joe was plutonium at this time. However, when we read Joe's intentions with writing the letter in the first place, just having the company of the Whitney's to hang out with them for a while seems a little too light, in my opinion. Joe says he's communicating the information in the letter to them privately, which I want you three eternally to keep in your own bosoms, for my feelings are so strong for you since what has passed lately between us that the time of my absence from seeing you so long and dreary that it seems as if I could not live long in this way. Those are some strong feelings for people who were simply good friends. Now, granted, the Whitney's and Smith's go way back to the earliest days of Kirtland. I mean, in fact, Newell K. Whitney was the first person that Joe and Emma met when they arrived in Kirtland in early 1831. They began forging a very close relationship with the Whitney's from that time forward. Joe and Emma were 26 and 28, respectively, at this time. Emma was pregnant with twins. Little Sarah was just five years old. Sarah and Whitney. Joe's current teenage wife. She was five years old when Joe met her. So one interesting, you know, (laughs) piece of the history is if young Alvin Smith, you know, the first son of Joe and Emma had survived when he was born, he would have been just two years younger than Sarah when Joe and Emma first met her. And here we are 11 years later, (laughs) Joe's married to her. Now, the, the circumstances of Joe and Emma meeting the Whitney's is interesting. And this is an article that was written by D. Michael Quinn. And he wrote of their first exchange. This is this is actually from a December 1978 article about the Whitney family. This is published by the church. It's currently on LDS.org. You'll find it, you know, you know, a link for it in the show notes. This is back in the heyday of Mormon history in the 70s and 80s when the church was actually publishing legitimate <laughs> academic articles as themselves instead of, you know, pawning it off on the Joseph Smith papers or the, you know, the Neil A. Maxwell Institute like they do today. So this is from D. Michael Quinn. Quote, young Newell grew up only a few miles from the birthplace of Joseph Smith, who was 10 years his junior. Yet the two first met as grown men far from the Vermont of their childhood. In February 1831, the prophet Joseph Smith entered Newell K. Whitney's store in Kirtland, Ohio, and exclaimed to the startled proprietor, thou art the man. Newell protested that he did not know the stranger, then heard the life changing words. I am Joseph the prophet. You prayed me here. Now, what do you want of me? What a cocky snot rag, right? It was true that he had prayed the prophet there, although few of America's millions, less than 10%, belonged to any church after the end of the American Revolution. Many sought religious truth. Newell and his wife, Elizabeth Ann Smith, were among them. Members of no church, they earnestly studied the Bible, tried to live Christian teachings, and engaged in private devotions. Shortly before the organization of the church in 1830, and about two years before that meeting with Joseph Smith, the Whitneys joined the Campbellites, forerunners of the present Disciples of Christ. With Sidney Rigdon, they subsequently left the Campbellite group in an effort to live with all things in common as the early Christians had done. 
From that time forward, Joe and Emma were really close friends with the Whitneys. So with that in mind, that's a little bit of historical context and the history of the Whitneys and the Smiths. Would deep friendship alone explain the wording that Joe used in the petition to the Whitneys to you know, keep it secret at all costs? I don't know. It, this doesn't seem to explain everything in my mind. He even referenced what had passed lately between us, which must have been an allusion to their sealing three weeks prior, right, of Sarah Ann and Joseph Smith. If this was merely a friendly meeting, why would he remind them of what had transpired recently between them? You know, maybe he was trying to repair hard feelings. Maybe he just wanted to see his new wife again. Like I said, there, a lot has been written about Sarah Ann and Joe's marriage. You'll find a bunch of links in the show notes for further reading. You know, if you're interested, and this includes a 1973 pamphlet from friend of the show, Michael Marquardt. This marriage represents one of the better documented of the early, uh, the earliest polygamous marriages. And, and why I say one of the better documented is because it exhibits Joseph's methods. Okay, so we're going to dwell on the Whitney's briefly to understand the relationship dynamic that facilitated this letter. We're going to return to the letter with a little bit more historical context here. Helen Mark Kimball, this was Joe's youngest wife when he married her at the age of 14, a year away from where we are in our timeline. So Helen Mark Kimball provided a bit of context concerning how Joe had propositioned the Whitney's in order to take their teenage daughter to be his wife. This was reported in the 1st of March, 1883, Women's Exponent in Utah. So this is more than 40 years after the fact, and it's from a secondhand witness. This is not the best evidence. Just keep that in mind. But it does provide some interesting context. Quote, Bishop Whitney was not a man that readily accepted of every doctrine and would question the prophet very closely upon principles, if not made clear to his understanding. When Joseph saw that he was doubtful concerning the righteousness of the celestial order, he told him to go and inquire of the Lord concerning it, and he should receive a testimony for himself. The bishop with his wife, who had for years been called Mother Whitney, retired together and unitedly besought the Lord for a testimony, whether or not this principle was from him. And they ever after bore testimony that they received a manifestation, and that it was so powerful they could not mistake it. The bishop never afterwards doubted, and they willingly gave to him their daughter, which was the strongest proof that they could possibly give their faith and confidence in him as a true prophet of God. Giving their teenage daughter to the 36-year-old Joseph Smith. Proof of their faith and confidence of him, in him as a true prophet of God. Just let that bounce around in your mind for a while. What's interesting here is Helen also added that Sarah was willing in this transaction, but that she had to hide the marriage from her brother, Horace. Now, Joe apparently knew that the Whitney's son, Horace, wouldn't be all right with Joe marrying his teenage sister, and Joe decided to send him on a mission to the East. So not only did Joe send... Another man's, you know, <laughs> another man to uh, a foreign country on a mission when he tried to marry his wife, but also sent a brother to a foreign land, well, to, you know, the eastern states on a mission when he was trying to marry his teenage sister. I mean, just, just try and think of the twisted set of family relationships in jeopardy with this marriage. By their own account, Newell and Elizabeth were willing to let Joe take their teenage daughter to be his polygynous wife, likely given him without Sarah's consent or her fully informed knowledge here, right? Uh, that's, the thing is, they, but they had to hide this from Horace Whitney, her brother. This is what Helen added, which leads me to believe that Sarah was willing and that her mother wasn't exactly aware of the entirety of this situation, which actually contradicts another statement from Sarah's own mother, Elizabeth, you know, Mother Whitney. And we're going to read that in a minute. This is what Helen Mark Kimball added, quote, Sarah Ann took this step of her own free will, but had to do it unbeknownst to her brother, Horace Whitney, which grieved her most and also her mother that they could not open their hearts to him. But Joseph feared to disclose it, believing that the Higby boys would embitter Horace against him, as they had already caused serious trouble. And for this reason, he favored his going east, which Horace was not slow to accept. He had had some slight suspicions 
that the stories about Joseph were not all without foundation, but had never told them, nor did he know the facts till after his return to Nauvoo, when Sarah hastened to tell him all. It was no small stumbling block to him when he learned of the course which had been taken towards him, which was hard for him to overlook. But Joseph had always treated him with the greatest kindness from the time he came to live in his father's house in Kirtland. End quote. Yeah. Weird. When Horace got back from his mission and found out that, oh, all of those rumors that Joseph was, you know, committing adultery rampantly had an entire spiritual wife system. Oh, his sister's caught up in it. Oh, awesome. Doesn't sound like he was too thrilled about the whole situation. But it obviously is a matter of conjecture whether or not Sarah was willing in this whole exchange. Uh, unfortunately, the historical record doesn't care what we want to know about it. It just is. So this was what we just read. That's a much later reminiscence. It's from a secondhand account. However, Mother Whitney herself spoke of the situation concerning Joe and this proposition to her daughter. Now, this account was also published in the Women's Exponent nearly 40 years after the fact as well. It's quite revealing. Quote, Joseph had the most implicit confidence in my husband's uprightness and integrity of character, and so he confided to him the principles set forth in that revelation, Doctrine and Covenants 132, and also gave him the privilege of reading and making a copy of it with Joseph C. Kingsbury as copyist, believing it would be perfectly safe with him. My husband revealed things to me. We had not always been united and had the utmost faith and confidence in each other. We pondered upon the matter continually. And our prayers were unceasing that the Lord would grant us some special manifestation concerning this new and strange doctrine. Okay, now let me take a pause from that because this is important. This is when apparently Newell and Elizabeth Whitney were toiling about Joe's proposition to their teenage daughter, deciding whether or not this is actually from God. Then they have a meeting with Joe. This is now he may be referring to what has lately transpired between us. Maybe Sarah had opposed it. Maybe this letter is uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what to make of this. I don't think the letter is uh, falsely dated because where it stands as far as uh, where it fits into the historical record. This is very clearly written from when he was in hiding from, you know, in the basement of Granger's house. And th that was only for a few days, so this letter is dated quite accurately and corroborated. But maybe, you know, Sarah had denied after she had been sealed to him and realized that this marriage would be uh, also include a sexual dynamic and didn't didn't want to do it. And then they had this meeting with Joseph late night and had the, the manifestation that they were looking for. The, the thing is, is, this is very controversial. The timelines here are not set in stone. It's very challenging to put my finger exactly on what happened here. Needless to say, when the Whitneys were toiling over whether or not to give their teenage daughter to a middle-aged man to express their faith, their utmost faith and confidence in him as the prophet, after their meeting with Joseph, this is what happened. The Lord was very merciful to us. He revealed unto his us his power and glory we were seemingly wrapped in a heavenly vision a halo of light encircled us and we were convinced in our own bosoms that god heard and approved our prayers and intercedings before him our hearts were comforted and our faith made so perfect that we were willing to give our eldest daughter then 17 years of age to joseph in the order of plural marriage Laying aside all our traditions and former notions in regard to marriage, we gave her with our mutual consent. End quote. What kind of parents would give their teenage daughter to a middle-aged man in marriage under religious garb? Is that what you're thinking? Are you thinking that only because I just now said it? Well, what could possibly convince them that it was okay to do this, knowing full well what kind of life this may lead to. And beyond that, what's most amazing here, Newell Whitney himself performed the marriage ceremony between them, using the exact words in the magic spell that Joe told him to say. Now, this is considered an uncanonized revelation because Joe takes on the role of mouthpiece of God, 
but it's not in the scriptures. So he begins with promising that Joe's proposition to Sarah is of God and articulates covenants that God is making with Newell should he go through with marrying his teenage daughter to the prophet. And then it goes to the actual words of the ritual. Here it is. Quote, Verily, thus saith the Lord unto you, my servant, Newell K. Whitney, the thing that my servant Joseph Smith has made known unto you and your family, and which you have agreed upon, is right in mine eyes, and shall be crowned upon your heads with honor and immortality and eternal life to all your house, both old and young, because of your lineage of my priesthood, saith the Lord. It shall be upon you and upon your children after you from generation to generation, by virtue of the holy promise which I now make unto you, saith the Lord. These are the words which you shall pronounce upon my servant Joseph Smith and your daughter, Sarah Ann Whitney. They shall take each other by the hand, and you shall say, You both mutually agree, calling them by name, to be each other's companions, so long as you both shall live, preserving yourselves, preserving yourselves, for each other and from all others and also throughout all eternity, reserving only those rights which have been given to my servant Joseph Smith by revelation and commandment and by legal authority in times past. If you both agree to covenant to do this, then I give you, Sarah Ann Whitney, my daughter, to Joseph Smith to be his wife, to observe all the rights between you, both that belong to that condition. All the rights between you that belong to that condition of being married. But preserve yourselves. I do it in my own name and in the name of my wife, your mother, and in the name of my holy progenitors, by the right of birth, which is a priesthood vested in me by revelation and commandment and promise of the living God obtained by the holy Melchizedek, Jethro, and other of the holy fathers commanding in the name of the Lord, all those powers to concentrate in you and through to your posterity forever. All these things I do in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, that through this order he may be glorified, and that through the power of anointing David may reign king over Israel, which shall hereafter be revealed. Let immortality and eternal life henceforth be sealed upon your heads forever and ever. End quote. That's the ceremony. That's the entirety of it. And this is what happened exactly three weeks before this letter was sent while Joe was in hiding. Maybe once Sarah realized all of the, what is it, all the rights between her and Joseph that existed upon that condition that they were now married, maybe she wasn't so willing to join in. Maybe that explains this little uh, covert letter. Who knows, right? The thing is, Joe was in hiding, right? Newell and Elizabeth had gained all of the blessings for eternity, and the prophet had promised them if they gave him their eldest teenage daughter, who was literally half his age at the time in marriage. So now, Sarah Ann Whitney, possibly by her own desire, but obviously coerced in ways we can't imagine, was to observe all of those rights between her and Joe. This coercion is terrifying. The promises a person who claims to speak for God can make and what they can gain by those promises? I mean, uh, uh, Whenever somebody asks what Joseph Smith had to gain by lying about the Book of Mormon or his divine mandate, teenage brides and undying fealty from her parents who willingly gave their teenage daughter to him, that sure looks like a win from every direction that he's standing. So with all of that context in mind, let's look back at a few passages in the letter that Joe sent to the Whitney's while he was in hiding that sent us down this little rabbit hole in the first place. And if you three would come and see me in this my lonely retreat, it would afford me great relief of mind if those with whom I am allied do love me. Now is the time to afford me succor in the days of exile, for you know I foretold you of these things. I have a room entirely by myself. The whole matter can be attended to with most perfect safety. I know it is the will of God that you should comfort me now in this time of affliction, or not at all. Now is the time or never. Keep all locked up in your breasts. My life depends on it. One thing I want to see you for is to get the fullness of my blessings sealed upon your heads, etc. You will pardon me for my earnestness on this subject when you consider how lonesome I must be. What 
was this meeting. What was the purpose of it? What was the purpose of the utmost secrecy and the demand to burn the letter after reading it? What happened once the letter was sent? Unfortunately, those are all questions that are up for grabs and are ripe for speculation. The letter is just cryptic enough that the intent isn't readily apparent. Now, it may be that the letter doesn't require any deeper reading to understand it. Joe was lonely and asked some of his oldest friends to come hang out with him for a night. Sure, totally cool. He pled for secrecy to avoid being discovered by the sheriff so as not to be arrested and extradited. That explains the the whole point of the secrecy. Elizabeth and Newell Whitney had yet to obtain the sacred sealing ordinance that Joe had promised them. And Joe thought that while he was in hiding, maybe that was a good time for the Whitneys to, quote, get the fullness of my blessing sealed upon their heads, end quote. No record exists of whether or not the Whitneys actually went to the prophet that night. But records of three days later exist where Newell and Elizabeth were officially sealed together. This portrays a Joseph Smith who was lonely and scared that he would be arrested and killed. He wanted the camaraderie the Whitney's had given him for over a decade by this point. And, you know, conservative estimates are best in history. Those are all conservative explanations for what happened. But what about wild speculations? Speculation exists all over the map about this letter. Historian George D. Smith, he went so far as to draw a parallel between this communication and that of Napoleon to his lover, Josephine, after their first night together. The parallels are interesting. I mean, they're, they're superficial at best, but the situations are so fundamental, so fundamentally different that it's an exercise in futility to draw parallels. But an anonymous contributor to a Mormonism Research Ministry postulates that it was a love letter that you no know, Joseph sent to Sarah and instructed Newell to bring her to Joseph just for a conjugal visit. It seems plausible. Newell had performed the marriage ceremony, you know, three weeks prior to this, so that's not out of the realm of possibility. It's you know part of the duties of marriage. To think that Elizabeth and Newell thought that there wasn't a sexual dynamic to this marriage, that's it's simply laughable. Okay. Todd Compton, he did a great job dealing with it in his book, In Sacred Loneliness. He said, quote, the Mormon leader is putting the Whitney's in a difficult position of having to learn about Emma's movements, avoid her, then meet secretly with him. And that the cloak and dagger atmosphere in this letter is typical of Nauvoo polygamy, end quote. You know, that's that's a pretty astute sum, summarization of exactly what we see in this, this scenario here. The Newell and Avery and Mormon Enigma, they, they skip speculating on the content or intent of the meeting and merely speculate that Emma had no idea of the marriage. This is what they say, quote, This letter clearly indicates that Emma was unaware of Joseph's marriage to Sarah Ann. Newell K. Whitney recorded that Joseph gave him a blessing three days later on August 21st. The evening after Joseph wrote the letter, he went home under cover of darkness and spent the night with Emma, returning to his hiding place after conducting some business the next day. End quote. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? If Joe told the Whitneys to make sure they don't show up when Emma is home for the sole purpose of, you know, not being discovered by the sheriff, him going home and staying with Emma the next night, that reveals he either got sloppy or... Or that secrecy for that reason was never a matter of consideration when he was initially writing the letter. Now, all of these speculative lines fit within the bounds of the evidence, and they share the constraints of all Mormon history. Okay, the constraints of Mormon history may be limiting historians from reaching the most accurate conclusions, though. That's always the problem with historical speculation. We don't know what thoughts lived inside Joseph's mind here. We don't know what went through his mind late at night with his head on a pillow staring up at the ceiling. We don't know what he talked about with his closest confidence beyond what, you know, has survived in documentary form. But because nobody knows his history, it's up to us to construct it as best we can, which means speculating within the bounds of the evidence available to us. So my speculation, this is my speculation time. This is, yeah, take it for what it's worth. I'm no historian. I'm just talking. Joe was a contrarian to his culture in many ways. Maybe he invited all three of them over for some playtime. His new wife that he'd known since he was five times her age and two of his closest friends that he had known and lived with repeatedly for over a decade. If Joe Smith was the sexual revolutionary that people claim him to be, why is that only limited to him having one-on-one encounters with polygynous wives? A party animal like him running a criminal empire with his own army? 
maybe having all three Whitneys over for a night wasn't far out of the ordinary. Plus, we, you know, usually had some anointing oil mixed into the situations like this, you know, various Mormon elites meeting in a small room and seeing the face of God. Elizabeth even said that the family was wrapped in a heavenly vision, a halo of light encircled us, and we were convinced in our own bosoms that God had heard and approved our prayers. Maybe Joe really did get the fullness of my blessings sealed upon their heads. Hand wave, scoff, no. <laughs> Joseph Smith never had drug-infused orgies with members of Mormon leadership. That's contrary to the gospel. Yeah, <laughs> because Joe's actions never ran counter to mainstream Protestantism, did they? Now, I know the available evidence doesn't come anywhere near proving what I'm speculating on. This is terrible speculation by academic history standards. But since we're all lost in the realm of pure speculation concerning this mysterious meeting, shouldn't we be open to all possible and plausible lines of speculation? I've never seen any historian claiming that this is a possible explanation for the events of that night. Now, if Mormon historians are happy with claiming the Book of Abraham as a legitimate translation of the Kirtland Papyri as quote-unquote, historically plausible, I'm happy to live in this world of my own little historical plausibility, right? Why would such a claim be controversial or laughed out of Mormon history academia? Well, Joe is a lot of people's sacred cow. Their model of Joseph Smith operates only within very tight confines of what they think a pious religious leader would do. But if I've learned anything of Joseph Smith and all my studies. He, he didn't like being told what to do, and that includes by the cultural and religious milieu in which he lived. He was a kingpin at the head of a criminal empire. So is it presentist to confine him within those boundaries? Is that good history? I guess the question is, how revolutionary do you want your revolutionary prophet to be? That is going to do it for today. Uh, of course, we have a new patron and a couple of pledge edits to thank over at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism. Looks like we have edits from Kent and Jeff and also a brand new patron, Melanie. So to the three of you, thank you so much for pledging to support the show at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism. Listeners over there, you get the whole show. You get the uh, audio journal afterwards. Every Monday, you get an extra episode, usually our name of book club. You get a whole bunch of extra content. So if you want to support the creation of the show and you want to get extra content, eh, we'll try to turn your bang for your buck into the most entertainment value possible over at Patreon. Thank you so much to all of you who do support. Now, as far as next week goes, I am kind of wrestling with how to do this. I had a, a friend of the show, Jared, send in a, an email, and he basically said that he's so far behind on the show that he doesn't know what's going on when he picks up an episode and listens now. So what I'm going to try and do for next week is just take a step back. Just look at how we got to where we are, because I spent so much time in the original sources and original accounts I often don't take time to appreciate how we got to where we are. So next week, I'm going to try and do a bit of riffing on a high level overview of Joseph Smith and early Mormonism all the way through what you may have missed in previous episodes. I'm going to give you the episode numbers if you want to explore into those episodes and just do a review, not a year in review, but a four years of podcast in review and just let you know maybe some of the episodes that are details within episodes you may have missed and just hang out, just have a good time. So that will be our Thanksgiving episode coming out next week. And, uh, yeah, just letting everybody know a little bit of foresight of what we have ahead as I am continuing to compile the notes for the rest of the Bennett meltdown here. Just a quick step back and jumping right back in after that. So with all that said, of course, thank you all of you so much for listening, for hitting that download button and for sticking around and hanging out with us in early Mormonism. Take care, everybody. So I'll catch you next time here on the Naked Mormonism podcast.
This podcast is produced with the help of Julie Briscoe as production assistant and director of social media, and Brian Ziegenhagen as audio engineer. Music is produced by Jason Camo from a aloststateofmind.com and is used with permission. Naked Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnome Studios, LLC. Copyright 2018. All rights reserved.